Hello, my name is James. Is this the last class <laughs> before the weekend? <laughs> it's the, oh, that means as soon as I am done, you can. No so, weekend. Uh, no weekends? Yeah, studies tomorrow. Oh, what day is it? We have studies tomorrow. Oh, you have studies tomorrow. Oh, I'm so. In my country, the United <laughs> yeah, States, there's no studies on Saturday <laughs> or Sunday. So. But I'm not here to talk about the United States versus Russia. Um, and I understand many of you are studying to prepare for careers in business or international business. Yes. Is that? Uh, at least she is. So that's what I do, actually. And I never realized um, that I would wind up doing it. So what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes discussing what I do for a living and some of the interesting challenges that I face, and then perhaps we can talk about um, the cloud. So I've got this really cool job where I get to fly around the world and meet with governments and talk with governments about technology, about technology uh, challenges, and how governments like in Russia can invest in ICT so that they can be more competitive with India or China with what those countries uh, are, are doing. I've been at Microsoft for 17 years, so I looked like all of you when I started there. And um, I spent my first five years working on technology for running business. So not the things that you use on the desktop, Windows or Office, but our big server computers, our, our server software and databases and things like that. I then had four years where I worked on the staff of Bill Gates. And that was really interesting because he's a very, very passionate, intelligent man. And I got to go and have lots of discussions with him about projects. And then um, for the last two years, I've been working with governments, trying to explain to them why Microsoft is a good company, and um, what they can do to help themselves um, be more competitive in the international market over the uh, next 10 years. So the, the main reason I have this job is because Microsoft had some really big problems 10 years ago. Uh, in the United States 10 years ago, our government dec decided that Microsoft was a monopoly an illegal monopoly, and imposed all of these sanctions against us. Uh, the European Union did the same thing. Many other governments started attacking Microsoft because we were very successful, and we were an illegal monopoly, and uh, our other companies were trying to do whatever they could to hurt us. Ten years ago, they were in the kindergarten. Yes, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> so probably you'll explain what, was the, what the problem was. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, do you, do you guys have a clue? I have a clue. You have a clue? No, I, I, I can guess what, what happened. So, you sort of uh, partner, were partners with IBM, so that the IBM computers were produced. They have already had the installed operating system from Microsoft, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So, and we wound up becoming very, very popular. So, we were growing really fast. 95% of all personal computers ran Windows. And what we did is we, every time we would release a new version of Windows, we would have more and more features in it. So we would add to it uh, beyond, say, the calculator, but programming languages. And there was this company in California called Netscape. And they invented the first commercial internet browser, the software you use to read the web. Sounded like a good idea, and they wanted to charge money for it. So if you wanted to go to the web, you would pay Netscape $50, and you would install this software, and you would um, use it. And Microsoft decided to take a web browser called Internet Explorer and include it as a feature of Windows. Because and it was absolutely great from my point of view because you can buy a Microsoft box and you have everything inside. Just one with one exception. 
uh, the price. <laughs> the, they, as, as far as them working monopolies, they can put any price on this book. <laughs> so, what? What? Do you, do you guys know what a monopoly is? <laughs> they like it. A monopoly. <laughs> a monopoly is when a company has all of the market. And monopolies by themselves aren't good or aren't bad. They're not illegal. It's okay, in at least the United States and, and in many other countries, to have a monopoly. What's illegal is when you use the power you have in your monopoly to go after other markets and hurt other companies. So when we decided to take Internet Explorer and just have it be a feature of Windows, we thought that was an okay thing to do. Netscape, which made a living out of selling browsers like Internet Explorer, they were really angry with us. So they went to the US government and said, Microsoft is illegally using its monopoly in operating systems to hurt us in the separate market called inter internet web browsers. So it was this awful fight for three or four years in the US court system. And the US government decided that Microsoft was being an illegal monopoly. And we had to pay restitution and we had to do lots of different things. So in hindsight, this was very bad for our company because we used to be the company everyone loved, everyone thought we were really cool, everyone wanted to work with us, everyone wanted to be with us. And we wound up being so arrogant in the press that many people out there in governments and in the markets decided we weren't a good company after all. We were actually kind of bad people. And not only that, um, other governments, including the European Union, decided to go after us the way the US government was. So we went, when I joined Microsoft in 1995, everyone loved us, everyone thought we were the best company in the world, it was all great, and within four or five years we had a bad reputation, our governments were suing us, um, and things were really bad. Another thing that happened at that time is that uh, there were versions of products that we sold, like the operating system and Office, um, made by competitors that were sold with an open source license, so they were free. And there were people out there who just assumed that software is just going to be free for the rest of time. Because why should you pay for software if it's just this electrical thing that runs on here? So there was a version of an operating system called Linux um, that wound up being free, and there's a version of uh, Office called OpenOffice for doing spreadsheets and word processing that was also free. So, come on in, come on in, come on in, come on in. Come on in. Oh wow! Let's there, start, let's start from the yes, <laughs> there was a bus. Okay, I understand that this is your last class <laughs> of the week. So, here we had the situation where most governments in the world were fighting us. Um, there were free versions of our products out there that a lot of people were saying, oh my gosh, we should just use free versions of, of it. Um, governments like the government of Russia was saying, why should we pay for software when we can just have free software uh, out there? And come on. So, my job at Microsoft is to try and fix all of that. And we've been working at it for 10 years to fix it. So we want to fix the idea that governments think we're bad. We want to fix the idea that people think all software should be free. We want to get people who want to be able to get software to work with other types of software, if it's free or not free, to understand that Microsoft can be part of the solution and not part of the problem. And we want to do it in a way where um, we can help governments like the government of Russia figure out how they're going to use computers and ICT over the next 10 years so that your companies, when you're working, can um, be able to do good things here. And the way we've been addressing these problems is by going around and making big investments internally, but going around and telling the world um, that Microsoft has changed as a company, we've learned from some of the mistakes we've made, and we've become much more open. And when we talk about open or openness, what we mean is 
our software uses standards and um, interfaces that everyone can connect to. For people who want to use open source or other types of products, it works well um, with Windows. And then as customers and governments, like the government of Russia, makes this transition to the cloud, um, they do so in an open way. So that's a quick introduction of what I do. And do you have quizzes? No, it was like a bug. <laughs> OK, no, because we could oh, give a oh, quiz now. <laughs> well, I was telling um, my colleague Leonid that whoever um, asks the best question during this entire session, I will give their name to the chairman of Microsoft Russia as like someone who could potentially get a job there. So when we do the questions later, like I will remember the person who asks the really good one. So a lot of times in the software and computer industry, um, there comes along these concepts that everyone gets really excited about. And in English in the States, we call these buzzwords, where it's like, oh, there's this new thing that is really cool and everyone needs to do it. And the biggest concept and buzzword in the industry right now is this thing called the cloud, which apparently is what this lecture is all about. And the cloud, in one sense, the cloud seems like a silly thing. Because if everyone has been using the internet since you were all in kindergarten, 1995, um, you have a computer that's connected via a wire or Wi-Fi to other computers that are off in some building somewhere. And you can use that for email or for Facebook or uh, for messaging or Skype or whatever. So the idea of computers working over the internet is what many people think the cloud is all about. But it's actually a little more than that because most people who are using computers running on servers for things like accounting or class scheduling or tax collection um, or, or, or any other sort of application. They wrote their programs and they managed their computers the same way people and businesses have been doing this for 20, 25 years. So in this university, there's probably a class registration system maybe that runs on a computer. I know there's... Oh, but there, there is a security system because I saw as you swiped your badges, the little old men at the desk were looking at your photos as they were going by. So in olden days, back when you were in kindergarten, the way this university would set up that program is they would have a computer room in the back. They would buy 10 or 15 expensive computers. They would hire two people who would know how to install all the software on them. Um, they may have to put additional fans in the room because it gets really hot, um, because the computers generate heat. They have to manage all the networking to all of you. Um, and then when you add a new facility, they have to make changes to the program to run it in there. And it winds up that ICT cost for this organization and for most businesses can be as much as 20 to 30 percent of all of the costs within the company. And as people start investing more and more in ICT, there was a sense that I was getting less and less of a return on the investment. Because I would have to spend so much money on the actual computers, on the people to maintain them, on uh, the, the power facility, on doing the upgrades, that for people who are in charge of ICT, um, CIOs and their staff, they would spend up so much money and time just maintaining the things we already have that there's no money left for new programs or new applications or new things that you could do with it. And it was this way for 10 or 15 years. And users wind up being very frustrated and hate the, the, the computer administrators within their organizations because they feel they're very, very responsive. Business leaders, I've been told that all of you are going to be CEOs of companies in between five and 30 years. So, like, so in five to 30 years, you're going to be very angry with your CIOs and your people who run your computers because Everybody you... Everybody hates IT division. Yeah, because all you do is spend money. You're always late with whatever you deliver. And it, it breaks generally at the most important time. Like during this talk, all of a sudden this will go down. and, and so there's just a sense that 
We're stuck with a really bad system. At the same time, over the last 10 years, there are companies that deployed very, very large web services. So Microsoft has this email system called Hotmail. It's the largest email system in the world. It has 500 million users, and it runs on between 100 and 150,000 computers. And we, it's free. We don't charge you for it. We make money by selling little advertisements that you sometimes see on it when, when you go in there. So for that kind of model, the only way, the only way we at Microsoft can make any money from that is to drive as much cost out of the management of those 100 to 150,000 computers that run the, the email for 500 million people around the world as possible. So the way the techniques we developed to run all of those computers are completely different from the techniques the five or six computer administrators in this building use to manage the computers you use for your entry system where the old guy is looking at your pictures as you, as you go through there. Because instead of like managing five computers in a room, we'll take a building the size of this building and fill it with 50,000 computers, each one um, on like a little blade, a, you know, a, a board just like this where you have racks, boxes and boxes with four computers each on a little shelf that just go up. And it's not just Microsoft. Google runs about a million computers for their search engine. And they only make a profit when they can drive the costs out of serving up those searches to you as much as possible. Uh, how many, has anyone heard of a company called Tencent? Have um, any of you heard of a company called Facebook? <laughs> okay. Tencent is an internet company in China that has more users and more computers than Facebook. So it's, it's um, uh, they have messaging and then a whole bunch of different gaming applications on it. So Tencent in China has mastered these techniques. Facebook has mastered them. And the whole way of running computers when you have 100,000 of them and they have to work all the time, uh, you need to be able to add new programs and new applications without shutting them down and, and bringing that, that. That whole set of techniques is called cloud computing. And what's happened is companies like Google, like Microsoft, and then there's another company in the United States called Amazon. I'm not sure if, if they have much of a presence here. I need uh, to buy some books. Um, I think it's, we have the problems with the delivery yeah. of the goods. Through the so board. Amazon is another company in the US that it's the largest electronic retailer in the world. And they have 800,000 computers. And they started going to organizations like this school, like governments, like manufacturers, and, and basically said, you know what? Instead of running your application to let people into the classroom, that the little old guys, instead of running it on a computer in a room in here, why don't you just run it on our 100,000 computers and we'll charge you 10% of what it costs you to run it in here? because we figured out a way to get costs out of, out of the system. And um, for the business leaders of large organizations who are really frustrated with their CIOs because they say, all you do is get more money from me, but you're not delivering anything, they're suddenly saying, wow, I'll just get rid of all of these people who run the computers and just sort of manage the computers in my building, and I'll just pay Amazon to do it for me. They'll charge me less than what it costs in my building, and then what I can do with the savings is I can have new applications and new functionality and new programs available for everyone all the time. So that's what's taking place. Um, and you know, when I mention this idea of buzzwords, um, there's a long, rich tradition of exciting new concepts and buzzwords and ideas in the computer industry 
where everyone gets excited about it before it's, the technology is actually mature enough to use. So 20 years ago, there used to be a, a similar sort of buzzword called client-server computing. And there was a joke back at the time. Um, I don't know, I'll see if this works or not. Like, how is um, client-server computing like teenage sex? Um, because everyone's talking about it, but no one's actually doing it. And it's a similar sort of concept um, with the cloud, because everyone likes the idea, but you know, for your school to say, we're going to run our student security system on Amazon's computers, it's like, wow. Do we want the guys running in Amazon's data center to be able to look at all the photos of all the students in the school? Um, do we want them to have access to all that information? Do we trust the network will stay up between here and there? Because what happens if the network goes down or if there's a crash at Amazon? Do we suddenly lock the doors and, oh my gosh, you can't go to your classes because they, they don't let you in? So there, there's challenges from a security standpoint, from a technology standpoint, et cetera, um, that need to be addressed. But at the end of the day, the, the appeal of driving down the cost of running these sorts of applications pro provide enough of a motivation for the industry and customers and IT vendors to um, to work through the problems and figure out how to solve security, availability, et cetera, to make it happen. So even though this cloud computing thing is relatively early in its cycle, another like common, a, 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 a popular thing Bill Gates used to tell me was the industry always, always, always overestimates what it can do in two years. Like, hey, let's run all computing in Russia on the cloud. Can't do it in two years but underestimates what we can do in 10. And in 10 years, my guess is 80 to 90% of all business computing in Russia will be done in what we call the cloud, where there'll be these very, very large data centers with tens of thousands of computers in them, and then businesses will just rent out time on those computers, and they won't have to employ people to manage the actual computers um, uh, in, in the facilities themselves. And they have to solve the security problems. We in the industry need to, divide, to, to build systems that make it impossible for us to look at the pictures of all the kids here and to look at personal information. Um, we need to make sure that the stuff runs um, stably. Uh, it raises really interesting questions for the government um, because believe it or not, I've been told the Russian government doesn't want to run their applications on computers managed by an American company or even like in America. So, but it's not, you could remove the word Russian and insert the name of every country's government um, because they want to be able to do it in, in those environments. But it's just, it's really kind of a fascinating time because it's causing the industry to rethink approaches and concepts that we all assumed were standard and done uh, over the last 20 years. And we realized we have to throw all of that out um, and start again with, with new ideas. Oh, come on in. Should I start over again? <laughs> you have to sit in the front we'll, now we'll that you're late. After the lecture, and we'll explain here yes. uh, uh, everything she needs. I understand it's the last class. and um, So that's a quick summary of cloud computing. At, at its most basic level, it's a way to drive down the costs of computing by having someone else do it for you. Uh, may I ask you two small questions? Yes, you may. First uh, is um, about uh, software as a service. Yes. About this model. And the second point, uh, probably uh, we had met each other this morning. To, uh, we had a breakfast, business breakfast together. And I am responsible for the Russian Association of um, uh, the open source, open source uh, software. And we had a very interesting discussion about the future of the technologies. Where shall we meet in 10 years? 
the open source and the proprietor um, uh, companies who are running proprietor um, um, software. So, so the, the answer to the first question, software as a service is a way, is a, is a way to describe cloud computing. So um, you have a software program today, which is the security system that the guy looks at your pictures and it runs on a computer there. Software as a service is instead of asking the university to pay 100,000 ruples to buy that program and install it, we would simply say for 5,000 ruples a month. You plug in computer into the network. Yes, you plug your computer in, and all of a sudden that application is there for you. And the best version of it is always working there. Um, and we'll pay for the service. Yes. Not to Microsoft, but Correct. to the service provider. And we will guarantee, or the service provider has to guarantee that they've designed enough redundancy into the system so that it will never go down. And there's penalties that we have to pay you in case we prevent students from coming to class so because we would hate that. Will be a, a service. Now, this, yes. Now, the second question is an interesting one. The idea of this fight between open source software and proprietary software, which has been one of the most passionate fights in the industry over the last 10 years. Um, if we're now just paying 10,000 ruples a month to plug a wire in and have the security application just appear on the computers here, it doesn't matter if the software running in the big data center is open source or proprietary. It just, you just need it to work. So Microsoft right now is running open source software in our cloud data centers that we're making available to customers. Because it doesn't matter anymore whether or not there's a license for the software or not. All we want to be able to do is deliver a computing experience that the customer wants at a lower cost than our competitors. And this actually is really scary for many people who have made a career out of open source software. So for instance, uh, there's a guy named Richard Stallman, who I think is coming to Russia, He's coming. Um, who absolutely hates the cloud. Hates it, hates it, hates it. Because it gets rid of one of the most important justifications for having open source software in the first place. Uh, Mr. Stallman is the guru of open source. He's, he's the Taliban of open source, <laughs> is how some people um, describe him. So, okay, now we'll start the part of the lecture where you ask questions and I decide which person's name I should give to Nikolai, the general manager of Microsoft Russia. So, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Oh, uh, so, actually, first of all, thank you for a brilliant lecture and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, well, my question is uh, quite simple. Uh, what you just presented is, uh, just sounds like a, a B2B model. So Microsoft creates uh, some uh, set of computers who, uh, who provide some services generally to B2B sector. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it really sounds great, uh, no doubt, and so on, but um, it really looks like that uh, the focus of Microsoft uh, turns from the sector of uh, uh, say customer goods like computers, uh, mm -hmm. operating systems, uh, software, and so on, uh, to the sector of B2B. So just uh, it's like selling your uh, your calculating powers. Sure. So, um, don't you believe uh, that just uh, probably maybe it's somehow implied in Microsoft search? I don't know. Uh, but still, um, isn't it a danger that? Um, such a wide gap in uh, customer market, I mean the market of, say, notebooks, smartphones, and so on, uh, will result in such a thing that uh, mm, customers, or just simply people who work on, uh, on their companies and so on, uh, will decide that it's, uh, it's too difficult to work on two different uh, ideologically different platforms. Sure. Say, if you have an iPhone and you work on a Windows uh, computer, mm -hmm. on work, it's Really, it's really not a good idea. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an interesting question. Um, we'll watch the Mortal Kombat of platforms. No, what's, what, <laughs> what separates my company from Apple is in addition to building personal computing software and phone software, 
we've got a $30 billion business, $30 billion selling business software. So the software that runs the accounting systems, the HR systems, the databases, the servers, um, it's, it's a significant part of our revenue. Um, so it's not that, it's not really a new transition for us at all. It's, it's, I joined Microsoft to work on the B2B, the business enterprise part of the company 17 years ago. And back then it was a zero billion dollar business and it's quite nice to see our, all of our hard work result in success. But because we already have relationships um, with large business customers, it's an easier transition for us to make than other companies. May I say that probably it's a tendency in IT business. Uh, the example of IBM is uh, very um, interesting. Uh, they have started as the uh, producers of the hardware, and now they moved uh, uh, to the sector of services and consulting. Mm -hmm. And it's the main uh, point of their profit, the uh, main sector. Uh, probably Microsoft will, it's, it's a, a live company, <laughs> a leading company, and sure. uh, they, they will tra tra transform, transform their business. And it is the strategy of surviving on this market. Yes, absolutely. It's a great point. Yeah, actually, uh, Zario, I was uh, asking about this, uh, that uh, some customer goods, and you are brilliant to be to be uh, just services, uh, can work in a synthesis. So, uh, if customer prefer Windows uh, Windows operating system uh, on his uh, or desktop, uh, he surely will be uh, he surely would prefer a Microsoft B two B model. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, otherwise, it will it will create a problem. But, uh, don't you believe that it's really a good idea to shift your your, your focus? I mean, Microsoft focus. Uh, to the customer sector, because it uh, could produce even greater growth. Sure. I mean, at the end of the day, the only way we're successful is that we deliver products, either that you install or that you buy over a wire, that the specific target customer loves. So we've sold 400 million copies of Windows 7 in the last year. Um, that's a pretty good number. We also sell a lot to governments, and we also sell a lot to businesses. And it's hard for a company to focus on completely separate markets, but we think there's enough benefit from the integration across all of them that it's worthwhile for us. But these are excellent questions. I may need to get your name, but we'll see. <laughs> Any other questions? Wow, you're all just going to give him the job. <laughs> oh, that's because you all have jobs and you don't need. Yes, in the back. Yeah, right. Hi, this is Dmitry Novikov. And actually, I would like to raise the issue of reliability of the system. You have just a bit of uh, So if uh, the system has a reliability of level of 99.9%, it means that uh, 525 minutes uh, will be break, break down. So Correct. Yeah, practically per year. So actually, I would like to ask you how you as a Microsoft, as a company, would like to tackle this to just to solve this problem. Because it's really an issue for Russian companies because they say, okay, we ha you have to have a reliability of 99.9%, but it means that practically uh, more than 500 hours there will be a breakdown in the system. Sure. Um, I assume everyone heard that and hopefully you got it on the camera. Um, what you just described was three nines. Um, what we, our goal is to get to what we call five or six nines. So if you get to five nines, 99.999%, I believe that's 12 minutes of downtime a year. And then six nines gets you to like 12 seconds or, or, or something like that. I used to know this really well in a former life. Um, that's, it is, one of the most, absolutely most important engineering challenges we face. So you design into the system redundancy, failover, the ability to upgrade your backends, et cetera. And then for our customers, we put into the contract guarantees where if we fail to meet the minimum reliability that we agree upon, we pay them money back. And that's, you know, for any company, including Russian companies, that's the best way to demonstrate trust 
and to give your internal teams the motivation to make sure that they take this problem seriously. As the specialist in uh, competitive intelligence, you should ask Joseph about uh, James. James, excuse me. About, uh, Joseph is my brother. Good, all right. <laughs> and now we have more information about your family. Thank you. It was fantastic. Um, uh, what, what's happening with Windows 8? Windows. <laughs> no, actually, especially since I'm, I'm being recorded, the company really, you know, we've had, we had a developer conference in September in the United States called Build, and we introduced an early version of Windows 8 um, to our developer community. So if you want to learn more about Windows 8, um, there's a blog called Building Windows 8, and you can go up there and you can learn everything we've publicly told about that product. But it's a, it's a very cool product. We're reimagining Windows with the approach. It will run on Intel and ARM architectures, which is probably the biggest fundamental strategy change we've made in 25 years as a company. And my wife works full time on Windows 8, so I learn lots about it when we drive home at night. <laughs> Yes, uh, we've been talking about B2B sphere, and I want to ask you about B2C sphere mm -hmm. a bit. Like, uh, the question is that there are two main uh, operating systems on the smartphones, for example. The first is Apple, and the second one is Google operating system. And, uh, Which smartphone operating system has the second most share in the world right now? Bandu. Excuse me? You are Android. Android is number one. Nokia is number two, Symbian, um, Apple is three, and we're four. So why aren't you talking about Nokia in your question, when you said there's only two, when you just cited the first and third largest? Because, because Nokia, Nokia faces a lot of uh, troubles now, and because of Symbian, Symbian is really old-fashioned uh, operating system, and I think that if they uh, would not uh, innovate this system, they would not have any success. In, the, in this year, but uh, the, the question is that uh, Google uses absolutely open source operating system, mm -hmm. and the Apple uh, is a big, uh, is a bit uh, closed operating system. Sure. What do, what will you do for Windows Phone? To what will what will uh, be the difference between these uh, three systems? I mean, Google, Android. I mean, the, the second system is iOS five and Windows Phone. What is the difference between these two systems? Between uh, Google and Apple, everything is absolutely clear, but about Windows Phone, I, I'm not sure about the future of this. Have you ever seen the Windows Phone 7.5? Yes. Okay. So, so is your question, is it, it's, success in the market isn't determined yes, by... Yes, I think what is the advantage of this system? What is the advantage of Windows Phone um, versus um, Android and versus Apple? Okay. Um, in a nutshell, the Windows Phone delivers an experience that we believe is more streamlined than Android. It's certainly more secure than Android right now. I don't know if you've read the news. There are currently 110 botnets that have been written for Android because no one, including Google, is taking responsibility for Android security. And there's going to be huge, um, this is a prediction I'm making, it's not official policy, but my estimate is that there are going to be significant security issues with Android over the course of the next two years. Windows is available on phones from, I think, eight hardware manufacturers right now. Apple's available from one. So at a high level, those are some of the differences amongst the three platforms. And we think the partnership between Windows Phone and Nokia is going to be quite considerable for us because all of their phones will be shipping with the Windows Phone operating system starting right around now. So depending where you are in the world, um, the rollout will take place. But within 12 months, all Nokia smartphones will ship with Windows. Excuse, excuse me? In Russia, they will be available in November. In November. It's November now. I don't know. I don't okay. So we think the partnership between the world's biggest 
smartphone company and the world's biggest software company has the potential to add a third player in the market. I have another question to auditorium. When you go to buy a new uh, cell phone, are you looking for the operation system or are you looking for design? Both. <laughs> Both. Okay. Who is using Android? Uh, and okay, all the others. Oh, I'm not Android. Who is using Apple? <laughs> <laughs> Who's using something else? I'm using green. Who doesn't have a phone? <laughs> uh, it was a question for the kindergarten. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You have none. <laughs> well, uh, my question is not exactly connected with the topic of the discussion, but uh, you mentioned that you love your job, and uh, it seems that you are really loyal to the company. Have you ever thought of uh, working for a competing company? And uh, from your point of view, what is special about Microsoft's corporate culture? What a wonderful question. Um, the th there's two things I love about my job. Um, I get to do whatever I want to do. And as, as I tell people oftentimes, um, I get to make things up. So throughout my career at the company, and it's going to be 17 years in a few months, I've always worked on V1s. On, on the starts of projects. Um, I've always been challenged. I've always uh, worked with very smart people who I enjoyed working with. Um, I've not suffered financially from being at the company um, all of this time. There, there are a couple of times I get calls from other companies quite often. Um, I also love my wife, and she loves her job at the company, so we and try to, and we, and we both try to drive together, and we have two kids that are in the back seat of the car that we drop at school on the way in, so we've just got a nice life together. I mean, if, if you're doing something you like, you're with people that you like, and it gives you the opportunity to do interesting things in the world, then hopefully you'll be happy, and I'm happy. Thank you. Cool. Well, probably you don't know, Seattle is probably one of the most interesting towns where you can go uh, for, for a restaurant by boat. <laughs> yes. Uh, a lot of lakes and beaches. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and okay. it's a big town where the uh, biggest amount of millionaires in the United States. By the way, what's your name? Anna. Anna, you've asked the best question so far. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm serious because all, of, all the questions are good. It's like an even better question than the ones before. But what kind of career? Well, for my children. I actually have four children. Yes. Um, I have a daughter. So I have a daughter who I think is older than all of you. Um, she's 27. And she's um, getting a master's degree in nursing. Uh, um, and she wants to run a women's clinic. So she's, she's decided she's going to help others, and that's very admirable. I have a son who's 24, and for his baccalaureate, he studied philosophy. And everyone was going like, philosophy? <laughs> what? Oh, that means he's going to go back home and live on the couch. So he graduated two years ago and said, Dad, I haven't studied enough philosophy. I want to get a master's in philosophy. <laughs> and this was back when... And then I will start a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yeah, I'd love that. But, um, and this was when there was the, it was very hard to get jobs coming out of school because the economy was terrible. So he went and studied philosophy for two years. And while he was studying philosophy, he met a really cute girl. And they started dating. <laughs> really close. Oh, no, she was, um, she's a scientist. And he kind of said, wow, like, I bet I may want to spend my life with her, but I'm not going to be able to afford her on a philosopher's salary. So he, um, he studied when he was studying philosophy, and he just, he applied to the best law school in the United States, and he was accepted. So um, he's at Harvard Law School this fall studying. My seven-year-old son is in first grade, and my daughter, who's three, um, 
has a stronger personality than the other three combined. <laughs> and I'm terrified about like, what she's going... She's either going to be in prison or running the United States. It's one or the other. But that was a good question, too. Yes. Next good question. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I've got a few questions. Uh, the first is, uh, does the development of um, cloud technology suffer from the fact that most um, government services here in Russia run uh, illegal copies of Windows and other uh, Microsoft software? Mm -hmm. uh, and the second is, uh, you mentioned the benefits um, from using cloud technologies to uh, business computing, but uh, how can uh, an ordinary uh, person uh, slim their costs uh, by um, storing data in remote services? How can well, I capitalize on that uh, technology? So, two excellent questions. Cloud computing doesn't really change the economics of whether or not you buy a pirated copies of Windows or if you follow the law and you just buy it normally. So it doesn't change that experience that much. It's really focused more on the back-end server technology. And there are multiple offerings available today for free storage in the cloud, uh, including uh, a, a service that's part of Microsoft's live offering. And, and Google offers it, Amazon offers it, so you can go to Microsoft's live offering and store up to, I think, 50 is it 50 gig? I don't know. It's embedded Yeah. So it's just a normal, it's a normal part of the Windows experience where you can have free, basically unlimited storage. Uh, I must say that uh, 10 years ago, uh, we had research that uh, some of our enterprises uh, and even government services used 94% of file programs. In these 10 years, we moved to the figure 64. Uh, of course, it's not a very good uh, figure. I, I don't like it. But it's the most uh, amazing uh, fall of uh, using these pirate programs in any country in the world. So we have made a great job last 10 years. And I hope that next uh, 10 years, we'll cut this uh, to some, something like 10-15%. Uh, and will be in the in the, in the trend of all the other developed countries. Next question. In the back. Yes. You've been speaking about the cloud services for customers, and you've said that most of them are generally free. That Google, for example, are offering their Google Docs and something sure. like that. Sure. That's all free. So, where do they get from? You know, oh, is Google, when you use Google Docs and Gmail, they read, they have their computers read the contents of your documents, and they read the contents of your emails, and then they sell that inf information to advertisers, and the advertisers put an ad onto the web page, thinking, hopefully, that like if you send an email to your mother, about how you know you you really missed your dog. All of a sudden, they're going to put dog food ads up on the top of the page. There is no free cheese at all in the world. In yes. The yes. Yeah, you, you, you are signing the paper when you start when you start yes. Google on your computer. You are signing the paper. They agree. There's so the, the, and and the difference between Microsoft's approach and Google's approach. We 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 put ads up in our free services as well, but. As a policy, we do not look at the content of your mail and the content of your documents to determine what ads to, to sell you. Yes, and then when, what do you get money for? You do not, you do, you do not sell that. Well, we also have a version of our cloud services that we charge for. So the assumption that if it's cloud is free is not always true. It's simply, do we make our money by selling ads to people? Or do we make our money by having no ads and then easier administration and easier backup and things like that? Probably kind of a business model could be that we will pay Microsoft or uh, somehow through the providers to Microsoft for the service, for their platform, for using sure. your ads. And there's another interesting business model. Like electricity or water or shipping. How many of you have an iPad? Anyone? 
No, I have two. So like, <laughs> I have one and my wife who works on Windows has one. So it's okay. I have it's one, like, but I don't know how to switch it. Oh. So um, the iPad is a very, it's a very good, cool computer and computer experience. And in the US, it costs five to six hundred dollars. And just this week, this company in the US, Amazon, the biggest electronic retailer, is shipping a version, a slightly smaller, but equally good version of an iPad for $200. Um, so it's significantly cheaper than Apple's iPad. And their business model isn't necessarily to read your mail and, and put ads based on the content of the mails you send your mother. Um, they want you to use this as the mechanism for buying books that you read and um, for buying movies and buying music and buying um, and using the Amazon.com site for buying things electronically. So their business model, which is different from Google's, is instead of selling you ads, we're going to sell you music and books and other things. And we will subsidize the cost of the hardware um, so that you are so attracted by our cloud services on the back end that you, you'll buy $500 worth of things from us every year. So it's, 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 what's happening in the market is companies are looking at alternate business models than charging you for the software or charging you for the service um, in order to make money. And Facebook and Google sell advertisements and that's, that is the only way they make money. So they look at everything you type and everything, and then they put ads up there, which they sell. Um, Amazon will, um, tries to sell you books, movies, and things like that. And then Microsoft will try to sell you the software, sell you the Surface, or will sell ads, um, depending on which of the products you buy from us. So you're all for sale every time you go on the web. <laughs> uh, two last questions. My question is about the uh, tendency that states now face with uh, cyber terrorism and cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know that Microsoft is a great corporation, and um, of course you face this problem. And um, how do you struggle with this? What can you say? Uh, is it a great tendency for the states? And so, will this problem uh, be in the States later? And so, um, what is cyber terrorism and cyber attacks now, and for Microsoft especially? Um, for starters, when people started like hacking the internet and hacking computers, the first place they attacked was us. And there's something like 50 million attacks on Microsoft a day. So, we used to be terrible at cybersecurity, and now we're recognized as among the best in the world. And it's because we had no choice. We just um, had, had to learn it. And we spend a lot of time working with governments um, and, and sharing information with governments, including the Russian government, in what we've learned and, and what we've designed into our systems to be able to help them as well. Um, Cyber attacks and cyber terrorism is just a fact of life and it's going to be with us for as long as we computers, use computers and the networks forever and ever. And we just you know, need to continue to invest massive amounts of money. And I know Russia is investing massive amounts of money and my country is investing massive amounts of money um, to be able to prevent bad things from happening. Yes. We, of course, we can. It is the structure of trust. It will ruin this uh, trust vastly in uh, in these technologies. Uh, all the sector will be suffering. Yes. Excellent. So I suppose it is the last question. Yeah. It is. Uh, so it will be simple. Uh, what are your plans for the future? Microsoft or mine personally? <laughs> so next twenty years, Microsoft, and that's all. Um, twenty years. 20 years from now will be Windows 15, because <laughs> we ship every three years. Um, it's the, one of the cool things about 
this industry that I wound up spending my career in, is it's so unpredictable, um, especially if you're looking out 10 or, or 20 years. I mean, I've seen, um, I've seen concept videos that talk about what computing could be like 10 or 15 years from now, where um, this is just a computer on the surface and I can touch it and manipulate it because there's a camera up there that's recognizing where I'm putting my hands and the camera is tied to the computer that's right there, so. Excuse me? Oh, it, it could be holographic, but gestures will become, like, gestures and speech will sort of replace, yeah, so gestures and speech within 10 years will replace um, keyboards and mice. So 20 years from now, the idea that you're typing to a computer instead of just talking to it. The mice will be installed in your hand. Or like, <laughs> have any of you, Connect is in Russia, isn't it? Xbox Connect, where you go like this to use the computer. I mean, that sort of thing is just going to be a normal part of computing. So you'll be able to go like this. You'll be able to talk to computers. It'll use voice recognition to know who you are. Um, no, voice recognition in Russian is not available yet. But in 20 years, maybe. Uh, I must say that uh, the majority of uh, local installation in different languages uh, for the voice recognition was done by the Russian linguists. But we have no uh, any uh, request uh, from the uh, from the state or from the businesses to make the voice recognition for Russia uh, for, in Russian. That's the only reason. Uh, because I, I, I know that uh, we made it for Korean, uh, for some uh, Western languages, and even for United States. Uh, but it was Russians in California. <laughs> so. Um, one last thing before I go, or before we're done. Let me just write this down. My email alias is James U at Microsoft.com. If any of you want to do follow-up emails or are interested in like joining our company or anything like that, feel free to just send me an email. And um, I was terrified when he told me I'd be talking to the last class of the day about the cloud because I thought I'd get 20 people just sleeping on their desk. But you've been a very good classroom, and I really thank you for your attention and for your wonderful this is questions. The best university. <laughs> Obviously. Are we done? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Enjoy your Friday. Get a lot of sleep because you have classes tomorrow.